Nå, skal jeg Jeg sætter mig lidt bag, bag ved fjernet, jeg inviterer en hose, så lidt af tage, hvis jeg lige har øvet mikrofonen. Ja. Øhm, hvordan, hvordan, hvad gør jeg? Jeg går ind på YouTube. Ja. Øh, YouTube er... Det er Google, der. Okay, jeg går ind på YouTube, søger jeg på... Indo-European Religion. Ja, religion. Det er Hmm. Kanalen eller stream? Kanalen, ja, noget, jeg finder ikke noget. Jeg ser European Religion Projects på YouTube, men altså... Yeah. Uh, good, morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I, we are still waiting for a couple of uh, persons. I think that the rain is slowing things down. So if you have the patient, we wait maybe five minutes for this... Uh, Uh, missing. I I know there are some people who are kind of late. So if you have like five minute patients before we start, mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> we're not gonna be nine sharp. So just want to make you aware of that. Yep. Yeah. 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 Det skal vi finde ud af. Øhm, ja, jeg kan godt, eller vil du prøve at sige et eller andet? Men altså, lige nu kører vi ikke med den der mikrofon. Inputtet på kører jeg ikke få til at virke nu, så lige nu er det bare webcamet, der fanger det. Ja. Den er lidt forsinket selvfølgelig. Ja, jeg har slået så meget delay fra, at jeg kunne, men... Ja, 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 det er fint nok, der hedder det... Ja, det er mig. Ja, ja, det er klart. Men okay, du sidder selvfølgelig også lige ved siden af det. Jo, jo. Jeg kunne selvfølgelig også smide webcamet helt op, men... Ej, det er helt fint, det er det, synes jeg. Godt nok. Ja, men ikke med den, som jeg kan prøve, men jeg kører bare med. Ja. Ja. <tryk> <tryk> 
det er ikke noget med film, man ikke tager på sin computer, når man filmer på det Så derfor jeg har taget min iPad med, så jeg kan sidde og være... Kan jeg huske på... Ja, det er en lang dag. Det var lige opslaget, at jeg lavede min bakke og alt, med ikke mere og mere højt. Det er kun mig. Has what? Anybody watching this fine morning? One hundred viewers. Okay, good morning again. Um, so I, in, in opening the conference, I just want to uh, say welcome to everybody. And uh, I'll give directly the word to our head of Department of Nordic Studies and Linguistics, Anna Jensen. Thank you. So, good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Welcome to this conference and welcome to Copenhagen. I'm very sorry about the weather. Uh, we did what it, we could to change it, but we didn't succeed. But we did succeed in making a very Nice conference, I believe. Um, I had a, my uh, name is Annie Jensen. I'm head of department, as uh, Laura said, of the Nordic Studies and Linguistics Department at Copenhagen University. Welcome. <laughs> and we are very proud to host this Indo-European Religion and Poetics Conference, which is dedicated to three of the most fascinating dimensions of the Indo-European tradition. The primary scope of the conference is to bring together scholars who have an interest in Indo-European tra traditions in order to encourage an interdisciplinary dialogue and exchange of ideas on diverse yet interwoven aspects of Indo-European culture, such as ritual, myth, and language. Ritual and myth often turn out to be two faces of the same religious phenomenon language gives expression to this phenomenon and preserves it. This is the reason why this conference is centered on this very intersection of connected and sometimes indivisible cultural manifestations. Indeed, the program is heterogeneous from several points of view. First of all, it features both top key uh, keynote speakers as well as scholars at all stages of their career from master students to professors. Secondly, conference papers cover a ver variety of topics as they deal with several areas of Indo-European <coughs> studies such as etymology, phraseology, semantics, formal compositional pattern, comparative <coughs> mythology, and religion. Moreover, over all presentations are highly multidisciplinary. This profile, you could say, is very much in line with the scholarly approach promoted by the research center roots of Europe at our department. Since its creation, this center has worked to achieve a progressive integration among different disciplines like linguistics, archaeology, genetics, comparative mythology, and religion. The events organized in the framework of the summer seminars at North and also at Copenhagen's National <coughs> Museum are a clear reflection of this, as well as the most recent publications of the Roots of Europe. This conference aims at being a further asset to the Roots of Europe and to increase its visibility and on a global level. The interest for this conference can already be considered a success uh, and success uh, your attendance shows this you come from all over the world i believe and from uh, a very uh, different institutions 
and it went beyond the most optimistic expectations of the organizer, who is Laura. We are also very happy to reach our many attendees, attendees, attendees in absentia, namely the ones who will follow the conference on YouTube and other social media. <coughs> Given the limited time today, I will not make a long introduction to research in our department, but instead invite you to visit our website, which is in Danish and English, where you can read about our research and teaching activities. The department is the lar largest Nordic department in the country. It has around 160 full-time staff, including PhDs and administration, and it focuses <coughs> on most of the languages spoken and written in the Nordic uh, countries and on the culture and the literature of the Nordic countries, in all cases with an emphasis on Danish. The department covers a broad range of subfields in language sciences and communications, such as language history, psychology of language, cognitive and functional linguistics, social linguistics and dialect research, typology of language, <coughs> reading research, language technology, language teaching, and communication and media uh, research, and as you know, in the European studies, which is not known for the number of research, uh, researchers currently employed in the department, but for the very high level of the, their research and activities, and also for all the visitors that come to the department and to the uh, in the European um, um, field. Uh, and postdocs like Laura, who has been here uh, the last uh, years. Uh, and now Laura is, is organizing a conference as part of her, her postdoc uh, in uh, Copenhagen. And um, I would like to uh, say thank you to you, Laura. It's been a pleasure to follow in how you organize this conference. I mean, most people think that organizing a conference is a tough task. But when I asked Laura if that wasn't a lot of work, she said, oh, no, I don't think it's too bad. So <laughs> thank you Laura, for this. It's been, as far as I can see, very well organized. I haven't seen anything missing until now in the preparation. Um, so I've been looking at the program that, unfortunately, I will not be able to, 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 to uh, um, follow today because I have to go to a lot of boring meetings, uh, but it is very compelling um, when I look at, uh, I mean, it is very compelling when I look at all the titles of your presentations. So I would just like to say once again, welcome uh, to Copenhagen University and to Copenhagen for most of you and to the our department. And I wish you a very nice and fruitful seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Anna, for your compliments. And uh, so, um, hello again. And uh, I wanted to say, enjoy Copenhagen for opening the. I don't. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I hope uh, you had the chance to enjoy yesterday for sure, and that uh, weather will be better tomorrow. Uh, Finger crossed. I don't know. Uh, it's really unpredictable. Well, first of all, um, um, and in connection to what uh, the head of department said, uh, I'd like to thank the department. It, yes, it, it was. Uh, I, I had terrific support from the. Department of Nordic Studies and Linguistics uh, for the organization of this conference. And that's why it looks kind of easy every time. Uh, how is it going? Oh, well, fine. <laughs> yeah, so, so, of course, because they, they, they're terrific uh, in the support. Uh, they said yes to everything I've asked, and I'm grateful for that. So thank you again. And. Uh, well, uh, I've been wondering um, in the last few days about uh, what I could say to open this conference. And of course, I, I thought of uh, talking about how 
myth, uh, poetics, religion, uh, and the comparative approach to ancient literature are, first of all, beautiful, and secondly, um, how enriching they are for us as scholars and for us as human beings in the what Martha Nussbaum would call the search of meaning. I think that uh, I shouldn't tell you this because uh, you all know about this. I mean, your response to this conference uh, uh, was uh, amazing. And uh, uh, I have also seen uh, your, uh, I've been in touch with all the speakers uh, and I've seen how concerned they were uh, about their talks, uh, their abstracts, uh, everything. And this is proof of how much you care, not only of your work, but only to the quality of the field. So um, I will rather talk about what this conference means um, for me as uh, the organizer and uh, as a scholar and uh, as a person. So um, I, um, well, if I think back to uh, when I was a PhD student, I clearly remember the thrill of uh, taking out of the shelves some of uh, some amazing books. And I'm not only talking about the classical studies by uh, Rüdiger Schmidt, about Dichtung und Dichtersprache in der Germanischer Zeit, uh, or uh, of course, Calvert Watkins, How to Kill a Dragon, and so on. But also, uh, I'm thinking about proceedings of conferences. Take, for instance, the uh, amazing conference in Paris, uh, La Langue Politique in the Européen. Uh, I think the volume is 2006, and um, which featured uh, all the five keynotes that we are having today. There are all works for that volume. And I remember how um, when I first wrote, uh, when I first uh, read the book, that. I was um, so amazed. I thought, wow, I wish that I, I were older to <laughs> I had been older to participate to that conference, to enjoy as an audience, not, not as, a, as a speaker maybe, to enjoy the atmosphere, to take to listen to the talks, to meet these people who gave such amazing papers. And so this was one of my favorite books, but I, just an example, I could uh, take other many aspiring proceeding books of the kind. And uh, so, in few words, uh, a conference on poetic myth and religion was my dream. And so uh, I know also that this is, was also the dream of some of the participants today, that this uh, conference has been on your radar. This one works by quoting Michele Bianconi. Uh, and uh, well, thank you for your response. And uh, I'm just so happy that uh, I could put it together. And uh, well, with this, uh, it's just, I want to say thank you because you are, with your response, with your interest, with your participation, uh, you are making this amazing event so amazing. And uh, with this, I close my little uh, therapeutic uh, speech about my uh, younger Laura in the PhD. And uh, uh, just a uh, uh, few other uh, practical announcements for you. Um, well, um, you all received a conference kit, I believe. Um, you already know about that, but I, uh, I'm talking now to the speakers directly. It contains a kutu pass. This is uh, this little brush that you find, and it's uh, for an event uh, which takes place tonight in Copenhagen. I hope the weather will be better so that you can go around. But in any case, um, yeah, it's not something that we really have on a fixed schedule. We are flexible. Just I, I just want you to enjoy that. So I, I hope you will do so. Um, also um, about lunch. Uh, we will have lunch uh, in the canteen and we will walk the, uh, there together. It's very close. So, And 
Yes, I think uh, I'm done with the practical. Ah, yes, of course. I would like to introduce you, um, my the people helping me, Panile, who takes care uh, of the of the streaming, and you have probably already met Amy, Katrina, and Christian, who are uh, currently outside and who are helping me. So feel free also to uh, address them if you have any um, things you might need. And with this, uh, I close. I don't know if we are in time, um, maybe five minutes shorter. And uh, thank you again. And uh, I don't know if we have time, maybe we could do the shorter. <coughs> Ten and, uh, we, we can use maybe a five minutes break or ten minutes break, and then we start at nine thirty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Excuse me, did I get of my paper myself? Because sure. the main one uh, is a little bit.
Colleagues, um, yeah, it is a pleasure to be here and to follow the invitation by our friend Laura. And uh, let's go to our point. Uh, uh, the collocation uh, uphold heaven and earth uh, with a deity as an agent uh, is a metonymic uh, marriage in terms of uh, Calvert Watkins terminology for cosmos. It is well known. The, the collocation is attested in several languages, uh, including Anatolian uh, in the myth of Upeluri. Uh, and this, it is all in the framework of myths and conceptions, uh, which actually deeply differ from each other in the different uh, traditions. Um, uh, despite the fact that the collocation is expressed in the different languages by means of different expressions, lexemes, and, and so on, and with many varieties, there is something in common. Uh, the uh, aim of the present contribution uh, was, uh, will be, uh, first of all, to typify uh, the constitutive elements uh, integrated in the collocation, uh, the basic form is obviously uh, to uh, uh, to uphold uh, earth and uh, heaven and earth. This means cosmos. But there are also other elements. And once uh, we have attempted uh, to typify these elements, uh, the second point uh, will be uh, uh, on the strength of these uh, matches, uh, an attempt to reconstruct the prehistory of the collocations and eventually the aerial distribution of the different uh, varieties. Uh, two short remarks are in order, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, uh, we uh, certainly know that uh, the uh, expression devices are very different in the different traditions. Please have a look in point B, uh, and this is the, the Jaconu. Uh, if we have a look on the different uh, verbs uh, for uphold in, in the collocation, in at least six of the languages, we immediately appreciate that the forms are not the same. Only uh, we have we have only one uh, match, namely Hittite hark and Latin archere. We have also a second one, which is not in the table, namely Vedic stamp and uh, Greek astemfeos, solidly, uh, surely, and so on, yeah? But this is clear, yeah? So we assume that we can start uh, from the position that uh, even if the uh, match is not with the same lexem, the concept is the same and we can operate with this, yeah? Uh, a second point uh, could be, uh, en passant, uh, be uh, stressed. 
namely come back please to a oh, yeah so we know that uh, uh, heaven and earth is uh, yeah uh, 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 a merism for cosmos oh thank you oh sorry about that <laughs> better. yeah uh, and uh, in fact uh, this uh, merism may be an enlarged form and uh, including besides earth earth and sea uh, this has been uh, explained uh, lastly by roberto ginevra and by others yeah as uh, actually uh, the opposition between the upper upper uh, world half and the uh, uh, under uh, world half lower uh, world half yeah uh, actually we have both and uh, in our case we have limited to the, uh, the basic structure namely uh, heaven and earth let's please turn to to the uh, table in b and uh, if we have a look on this table uh, from the beginning uh, to for the sake of clearness uh, we can uh, state mm. that the collocation heaven and earth may have uh, some uh, enlargements or some uh, enlarged variants yeah if we have a look from left to right uh, in the second column we have the enlarged type uh, with uh, heaven and earth and sea and this means all uh, there are uh, cases of deletion where we have only uh, one of the elements yeah but this is not the, the problem here yeah we we appreciate simply uh, that uh, exactly the basic type enlarged with uh, c occurs also in latin yeah uh, and third and fourth column uh, are uh, possible uh, enlargements. One of them, uh, we uh, call it a pillar, is attested in some of the traditions and languages. Uh, shoulder are two, and uh, actually they exclude each other. It is only in Greek, in the myth of Atlas, that both elements coexist and co-occur. And this is to be stressed and to be explained further. Yeah. Well, so let's go directly uh, to the facts. And I regret that the handout is too long, uh, too long and too extensive. Yeah. But I assume also that the table uh, speaks by itself from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, well, also let's turn please to page uh, two, and uh, we are dealing now with the situation in Hittite. Actually. Uh, the main point is the myth uh, of uh, Upeluri uh, in the uh, history of Ulipumi. And uh, this is Hittite and this is Urian too. In other words, we are dealing here with an Indo-European component and we are also dealing with a non-Indo-European component, a cultural at the least. Yeah? Uh, obviously, uh, the expression is by means of an Indo-European verb, namely uh, hark, uh, to hold, to keep, to have, etc. Yeah, uh, the yeah the, the the verb has masterly been dealt with by uh, Calvert Watkins, and uh, what is interesting for us is uh, I have tried to uh, uh, to mark in bold uh, the the most prominent uh, terms for our attempt for our purpose. Also, we have the expression nepis tekan harsi. Uh, this is an invocation to the Hatti gods. Yeah. Uh, but the terms are clearly uh, uh, Indo-European. Yeah, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, heaven uh, and earth are uh, solid and uh, very, uh, uh, very well supported is a constant by mean of synonym terms. This is the case of Suhmi Li, uh, number two and three. Uh, there is here a kind of etymological problem, but this is not our problem here. The meaning is very clear, and the hair, the earth, and uh, heaven are uh, yeah, solidly, uh, solidly uh, well uh, supported and well, uh, yeah, uphold. Yeah. Uh, apart from this, uh, we have the same construction with the earth, with the heaven, and with the knees. In other words. Uh, the, the, the match is perfect, yeah? The contrary is actually cut, cut tinu, a strike. And this applies also to the Gnis. In other words, uh, the universe, the cosmos, and the Gnis is something which uh, can be upheld and can be shaked or striked, yeah? But it's clear. 
uh, and this the, the instances in 5a and 5b speak uh, speak by themselves yeah? uh, the further element and very important one number six is the attestation of uh, another element namely a pillar a pillar supporting upholding uh, the our cosmos yeah and this is clear as can be assumed in the text in number six if the interpretation uh, by pillars and chicago uh, dictionary is okay in order yeah but obviously the most prominent instance of this is number seven uh, in the song of ulikumi uh, the uh, complicated personality of uh, upeluri upeluri uh, rough form uh, in rough formulation the same as atlas in greece yeah uh, well in this case uh, number seven uh, uh, we uh, know that uh, earth and heaven uh, are uh, built on him and more precisely uh, number eight uh, he is uh, up and um, he is his, its shoulder who is uh, actually uh, upholding uh, the cosmos and the text uh, speaks by itself uh, they built heaven and earth upon me i was aware of nothing uh, and so on yeah uh, this also about uh, that uh, the two halves of the cosmos were uh, cut uh, from with a, a device exactly for this and so the text speaks by himself and he invokes my shoulder is suffering from this. Uh, in other words, uh, the elements uh, are uh, specifically huritic. They get into a complex and has always been understood as a part of uh, Anatolian huritic uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, it has been discovered that the match with Atlas was absolutely perfect. Uh, one can go a step farther, number seven, number nine, uh, <laughs> and, and we have... Uh, the heaven and earth uh, were uh, cut from each other with the help of a cutting device, a copper cutting device. Yeah, and uh, in number nine uh, we have all the elements practically together, uh, so the cutting uh, device and also the support, the basalt, uh, uh, the ideogram for Kukunci uh, von Schlagen repeatedly, and so on and so on. Yeah. Well, in other words, this is clear. And we have a situation, yeah, uh, this is very clear. Cosmos uh, can uh, is supported or can be just the contrary. And uh, it is an indication of uh, the shoulder of the person who is uh, yeah, upholding them. Well, uh, if we have a look now uh, shortly uh, to Latin, we find an amazing situation uh, because uh, the image is not so clear, uh, not so complete, not complex. Uh, but the lexem is exactly the same. Archeo makes one of these lovely uh, correspondences between uh, Latin and Hittite practically exclusively. Also, for instance, the case of Sarning and Sarkio repair, or uh, Capuai and Computare uh, count, and so on. Yeah, uh, It is not about uh, this point uh, right now, uh, but it is clear that the, uh, the match is perfect. And uh, it has been stressed, fittingly enough, uh, Greek archaeo is no help at all. Yeah, we can assume that archaeo has failed to conserve this meaning, and the meaning has been expressed by means of other uh, expression possibilities, namely by the mm -hmm. verb, which will be dealt in the next pages. I will not to say this because I would keep the secret hidden. <laughs> Well, uh, if we have a look in Ennius and the Latin archaic literature, it is clear uh, that we have omnia archet terram caelum, archet. In other words, we have the explicitation of what we can imagine uh, for uh, the Anatolian, uh, the Anatolian world, so to say. And uh, with uh, some different varieties, we find the same also in uh, later authors uh, proceeds and so on and so on number five and number uh, four and five speak by themselves <clears throat> what is amazing or surprising or remarkable is that in latin we have only the three elements yeah uh, we have as far as i know no mention of a pillar or a support or a shoulder nothing like this yeah uh, 
I would say that uh, a priori, if one thinks that uh, the, the, the the collocation and the, and the, and the, the um, the motif is actually Anatolian. Uh, it is hardly to explain uh, the coincidence with Latin, because Latin cannot be directly uh, object of the influence of Anatolian. Yeah? And on the other hand, it is uh, amazing too that we have uh, the uh, expanded uh, version of the uh, collocation of the merism with indication of Caelum and only this. Well, uh, if we so we have also uh, to uh, ask ourselves what about the situation in Indo-Iranian and in Greek, uh, where these verbs are not attested with the same lexem, and let's please turn to B three. Uh, in this case, uh, our candidate is obviously uh, the family of Thar, but not only this Thar and her, uh, in uh, up, uphold uh, support. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, we have also uh, other verbs with the same meaning or very, uh, very similar meaning, stamp or the scamp and so on, to prop apart, to give up, and so on. And we have uh, just the contrary, rejaya, agitate, uh, shuttle, and the like. Yeah. Also, uh, obviously, this, uh, this uh, lexem uh, looks very promising a priori. I have started some minutes later. Uh, I take uh, the people as witness. <laughs> well, <laughs> really, believe me. Yeah. Uh, in other words, uh, with this, uh, the comparison would be very promising, but the facts are uh, fairly uh, sad. Uh, we have nothing to do with this uh, root, uh, with Thor in Greek, or in Latin firmus, it is uh, I was not able to find one single collocation with uh, terra firma or the lake, which is very frequent in Roman languages. Well, uh, this is the case. And uh, if we have a look, uh, please, in the next instances, uh, the, again, the text uh, speak by themselves. We find the different terms for, uh, for uh, earth and for, um, and for heaven, but uh, not for water. Uh, if we have a look yet uh, now in uh, page four, number six, the, pil the pillars are also noted and they are uh, sure uh, were uh, fixed uh, pillars. Yeah? And uh, number seven, uh, we uh, learn that the earth is supported by beam or by a prop. Uh, the, pil the pillars of earth and heaven are also uh, well attested by means of the term stuna and so on. Yeah? Uh, well. In other words, uh, we see that, uh, so to say, Roth uh, said, uh, the only thing we have not is the shoulder in this case. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, an element uh, uh, which uh, is uh, very curious, number 12. Uh, so the pillar is also quoted as the pillar of justice. In other words, in uh, Iran, Indian and also in Iranian, there are a couple of indications of uh, a component uh, of, uh, of uh, moral values, of uh, ethic values, which are lacking in other cases. Also, uh, well, uh, the situation in Avestan is practically the same. Uh, and I will allow, permit myself uh, to go further and ignore this because they bring nothing special as against Indo-Iranian. They are practically the same. Uh, well, and very characteristically, uh, if we have a look in the point five of Avestan, uh, we find, like in, in Vedic 2, that we have the proverb V. V is, so to say, equivalent at Amphi. And we, have, uh, we shall find this in Greek. Let's turn to Greek. And in this case, we have uh, uh, yeah, uh, the case of uh, Greek is the case of Atlas and Upeluri. It has been understood as, uh, uh, yeah, either as a coincidence or as a specific Greek development. The last possibility must quietly uh, be ruled out, <coughs> yeah, long ago. The coincidence is clear. If you have a look in the first uh, text uh, with Homer, Odyssey, we have uh, all the elements. We have hoste, talases, passes, pentea, just like upeluri. Also, uh, what has uh, Atlas to do uh, exactly 
under the sea and it's the same like Upeluri. She is under sea and supporting with the shoulder the pillars of the cosmos. Yeah. So this complicated situation is here very, very clear. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, another element uh, which is common is of cultural nature. It is about actually uh, the fact that uh, they are paying for something they have done. In the case of the Anatolian Hapeluri, he is paying for his collaboration with this tube. In the case of uh, Atlas, he is paying for having been uh, against Zeus at some times. And they are doing exactly this. What is amazing in the case of Greek, I assume that the instances speak by themselves, uh, is actually that uh, we have, so to say, a conflation of both elements. We have the shoulder, the pillar, the pillars, and the cosmos. All three at the same time. That is specific of both traditions: Anatolian, Puritan, and uh, Greek. And this is which makes uh, Greek absolutely special. Well, let's ignore uh, the points uh, about Armenian. I owe all this to my uh, young colleague, uh, uh, not so young now, uh, Daniel Kuligan. And uh, <laughs> they are younger than then, yeah? And, uh, and uh, let's uh, shortly, uh, let's ignore also a possibility to find a, a reminiscence of this in the epithet Throsia of Artemis. I have assumed that Artemis Throsia is the Artemis who is upholding a kind of a religious order in his community. This has been developed here, but we have no time for this. Uh, the last point uh, we can stress is the, that specifically in Indo-Iranian and in Greek, we have a um, shift from a uh, cosmological uh, uh, domain to ethic, uh, politic, ideologic domain. And so in the same manner that uh, the uh, pillars uh, uphold uh, cosmos, uh, truth and right and correctness is also uphold either by a pillar or by uh, the God. And this is the case, and we can uh, turn uh, to the end of our uh, of our handout, uh, namely uh, in the last uh, page. Uh, we know that uh, the good, the right, the true can be upheld by uh, the person or by the god. It is the case of the Raya Waus, the supporter of uh, the good, and so on and so on. The collocations in our uh, last point are clear, I assume. Uh, vasuni Tharaya is support the good, the good things, the good matters. And this is also further uh, again in the domain of the human uh, values. Well, if this is so, uh, what is amazing is, let's go please to the final, total final of the uh, handout in page nine. Uh, have we something like that in Greek? Actually, uh, this is not so clear formulated, but if we have a look in our last paragraph, C2, we have uh, that uh, assuming that EU, EU in Greek uh, fits with uh, both, actually, Vasu and Asu, we see that the collocation with Echo, keep, uphold, uh, are uh, sporadically attested. Number one in the Odyssey, Eudikias anegesi, this is to uphold the truth. In other words, in this case, we should have a, a nice case of transposition of cosmological uh, vision uh, to uh, human values. This could be the point. Also, let's uh, we sum, uh, let's uh, shortly uh, uh, sum up. Also, we assume that we are dealing with uh, two traditions. One of them is uh, surely common to what we call in the European art, what we call uh, Anatolian the verb to uphold with the same lexemes also in latin and with similar in greek echo and others stamp and astemphes uh, we assume that we have uh, as the object the meris have and earth the cosmos eventually enlarged by uh, the uh, sea we have the pillar 
and the foundation of all this. Yeah? We have also some development which is restricted to uh, Greek and Indo-Iranian. This to support the justice, the right, and so on. This can only be uh, specifically core Indo-European and more than this, Greek and Indo-Iranian. Yeah? In other words, for all this, there is no need to invoke uh, an Anatolian influence on Greece and on other languages. It would be absurd. On the other hand, we have uh, specifically coincidences between pure right, Anatolian, and Greek, uh, especially uh, the myth of the, her uh, the hero or Jahayan who is supporting the, with the shoulders, uh, the, the pillars and the cosmos. This can hardly be fortuit uh, coincidence. In other words, uh, we have two traditions, and in Greek, we have a coincidence, a uh, melting of both. Thank you very much for your attention and apologize for. Enjoyed and uh, sorry for the anxiety. Yeah, I was sorry. always there to. <laughs> and um, okay, we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? Comments? I would be delighted to get the lesser provocation to keep on speaking. <laughs> 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 okay, if there aren't any, I will. I have just a couple of comments actually, uh, and uh, maybe a short, short question. And a uh, um, couple of short questions. So, uh, starting from uh, the end. Um, you uh, have uh, just last, very, very last on uh, page number nine. Yes. Has, you have this, um, this Greek names. Sosidikos, uh, Sasidika, and Echedikos. So, do you think also Kistemi could be a sort of uh, a tax continuante of uh, Dhar? Do you have evidence in favor of this? Um, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you could expand maybe yeah, on this. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, maybe it was, maybe I, uh, I compelled you to skip it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I, as politicians say, um, I am glad that you asked me this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, very important point. Uh, actually, uh, as yeah, yes, absolutely. We now we operate with uh, similarities, with uh, coincidences, and with synonymity, if possible. And in this case, uh, if we have a look on page nine on the top, also actually, ejedicos, uh, In the first member, we have actually sech. Uh, in the meaning, uh, inherited uh, as we find it in amphi echo for supporting uh, the cosmos. This is clear, yeah? Uh, and uh, if we please turn to page eight, we have here uh, in the number, at the, at the in the bottom, uh, we have eudikias anegesi. We can assume that apart from the third verb, ejo is the term, the verb, uh, meaning uh, to stand, uh, to up, uh, hold, and so on. Apart from this, uh, let's observe, does this verb, uh, actually uh, makes the same uh, the same uh, as uh, itai hark also uh, as lexically side or grammatically side as had actually yeah? in this case uh, if we assume this uh, the other point is uh, what are onomasiologic in, in an onomasiological approach our terms for uphold support uh, defend and so on and so on yeah archeo could be also there but there is nothing with archeo that is hard. And uh, another terms are sosidicos. So is uh, to keep in order, not only safe, but to keep safe, yeah? And uh, I must confess, I have not been able to find phraseology to support this form. Either we assume that sosidicos is an irrational compound, but I don't believe, or we assume that uh, to keep safe, this is practically synonymous of uh, uphold this. 
And the same could apply for Stasi Dica, uh, which actually uh, Stasi in the transitive uh, meaning sta is uh, to, to put something uh, upright. Yeah, this would be the uh, point. Yeah. Uh, one short thing about this, because in, in connection to your, uh, it's just a, you know, very broad, broad connection. But uh, you had this example with uh, uh, good uphold uh, means uh, in, yeah, uh, yeah. in the, does, but yeah. this is, at least it's one interpretation. And uh, um, mm -hmm. and this parallel with the construction of, a, of an object, of a building, mm -hmm. I don't know, and the body parts. And uh, it's a kind of a system of parallel images which proceed in parallel. And um, in this connection, it's very interesting that you have this, uh, like in the Atarva Veda 4, 12, uh, this charm for uh, healing a broken bone, mm -hmm. at least in the Shaunaka. Um, the final uh, invite to for the healing patient with the broken bone is stand upright with it, uh, with stuff. And uh, Udva, and this would Udva, apply, uh, yeah, and uh, would apply very well to thank you, um, thank you very much. the body parts, to the chariots, to yeah. but to the cosmos as well, to something <laughs> which is broken and needs to be fixed. So that is just with a Udva. very uh, yes, with the Pratish uh, Tati Udva or something like that. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you again. That's <laughs> who will present uh, what's the title of your talk? Brief of speech in the neo georgian uh, funerary course. See in fact if possible. So good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my amazing friend, Laura, for giving me the opportunity of presenting my paper here in Copenhagen. So let's get it started. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about um, ritual speech in the neo Fijian funerary curse formula. And uh, as you can see from this map, drawn by Tomei Obrador Cursa, uh, the neo Fijian corpus is quite monothematic, I would say. Um, the green dots represent... Oh, sorry. Uh, the green dots represent the place where the Neo-Phrygian inscriptions uh, bearing curses have been found, uh, whereas the blue dots represent the places where we have only, uh, also, let's say, other kinds of inscriptions, and we only have, like, four of them. So it is possible to say that Phrygians curse a lot. And uh, so uh, Neo-Phrygian curses are almost exclusively funerary curses, uh, caved on door stones, like the magnificent one you can see here in the first picture. Um, but it is possible to find um, also more traditional ones, like the, the second picture you can see here. Um, so the neo Phrygian funerary curses are publicly written on the gravestone by the owners of the tombs, so without concealing their identity, to warn any potential desecrators that evil would befall them if they should violate the grave in defiance of the prohibitions against doing so. Uh, it is possible to say that this corpus has a strong formulaic character as the basic formulation, leaving aside all the possible variations that we can find in, in the funerary inscriptions, uh, runs as follows. 
So you have Yosni Semun Knumane Kapunada Ketipetik Menusaitu, whoever does any harm to this monumental Hindi curse. And the formulaic character of the neo Phrygian fear and curses pertain to ritual speech. So, from a pragmatic point of view, the usage of specific verbs indicating specific acts or verbal activities, such as ask, deny, beg, wish, etc., is crucial in order to perform the speech act itself. As the ritual verb, so the verba concreta, are considered identical with the ritual actions. And in the case of funerary imprecations against grave desecrators, the speak art verb is curse, of course, and the ritual action is cursing. So uh, curses can be included in the category of declarations, according to Searle's model, uh, because they bring about some alteration in the status to, of the referred object, solely in virtue of the fact that the declaration has been successfully performed. So uh, neo Phrygian curses, in my opinion, can be understood as supernatural declarations because they are performative words that bring about the predicted harm through supernatural and or divine power. Uh, curses, in fact, were meant to establish an automatic link between crime and penalty mm -hmm. independently of social political institutions in case of violations under the watchful eyes of metaphysical agents and through their direct intervention. So uh, given the concrete value of funerary curses, Merely spoken curses were not considered enough to pass through this test, but they had to be written, and more specifically, on the stone, in order to be effective. And uh, whenever language is meant to produce a specific effect on the world, several devices are put in place in order to increase their performative power. Um, the rhetorical devices which are employed in the funerary curses are not merely the residue of an oral transmission phase, but the testimony a desire of putting linguistic resources derived from oral riddle speech at the service of the new needs associated with writing, so this new contract act value. And in this paper, so I will focus on the following one, the speech adverb to tetic menos, the bilingual structure, the binomial expressions, and the metric regularization. Uh, okay, so uh, tititic menos uh, can be analyzed as the middle perfect participle of the verb tic, so athematic and reduplicated, plus the preverb t. Uh, from an etymological point of view, I would agree with Alexander Lubotsky, who reconstructs the origin of neo Phrygian t as deriving from Proto European dwells, so split, divide in two, uh, with the voicing of the initial dental voice top, so Proto European d would regularly give Phrygian t. Uh, as for the etymology of tick, though, scholars have pointed out <coughs> different options, namely derivation from pre European tag, so point, show, or from pre European tag, so pairs. Well, if the tick is derived from pre European tag, so with this devoicing of the initial dental voice job, um, it would be cognate with the Greek words decay, justice, decazo, to judge, and in particular, according to Lubotsky, with kata decazo, to condemn. Um, however, uh, etymologically, deik means to show and no to judge, which is a semantic development of Greek, Latin, and Germanic uh, developed later, but which may not necessarily be shared by Friedrich. Uh, so, also keeping into account the ritual speech, mm -hmm. I would like to prefer to connect tetic menos to the Indo European uh, root steg, so steg purse. And in this case, steg would be comparable to the uh, Greek verb stizo. Sting, drink, mark. The absence of the S at the beginning of the uh, Phrygian form is not surprising since we're dealing with the well known S mobile. Uh, the devoicing of the voice job is regular in Phrygian, so per the European G, you would definitely give Phrygian K. And so I think that phonologically it, it's good. And from a semantical point of view, I think that the act of cursing conveyed by the Proto European root stake could be related to black magic rites, which prescribe harming someone by cursing a voodoo doll with sharp objects. And the intended victim is supposed to suffer while well, the doll is being pierced, of course. As Benedict Sadowski explains very well, these are very old practices that are firmly rooted in the magical thinking of the Indo European and the Semitic world. And as for the semantic, uh, um, of the, of the research of the Greek or Roman world, Christopher Faraoni carried out for the first time a specific study on voodoo dolls. Um, so, for example, this is uh, one of the dolls that he analyzes in his studies, was found in Egypt. Uh, but then the survey has been recently updated by uh, Gregorian Mess by adding the most recent pieces that have been found also in Great Britain, Moldavia, France, Romania, etc. 
a syringa. Actually, Ludol existed as well. For example, a counter cell of Cositra Sutra 29 uh, mentions a sharp effigy made of clay. And concerning the Roman world, Ovidus, for example, in the Eroides and the Amores, attest that also voodoo dolls found uh, in walks and wool were used. So you can find the example on the endowed point 2.6. Um, then uh, we could say uh, that the actual right of cursing the voodoo doll can be accompanied by specific spells with enumeration of the individual organs of the victim's body, uh, finally focusing on vital items, uh, in particular the liver. Uh, handout 2.7, the transcription of the Greek magical papyri 4, uh, 296 through 28, gives us very precise indications concerning the position of the needle so that the spell is effective and a perfect parallelism even concerning the parts of the body to be cursed can be found in Atrabaveda Saunata 325-36 and several defixiones in Latin as well present detailed enumerations of all the conceivable constituents of the human body that can be cursed. Um, concerning the Proto-European root stag in this context, uh, the Greek magical papyrus 16, lines 15 and 64, has the Greek verb stixai, uh, used to describe the first victim heart with blood gushing out of the wound. The same image, even though with another root, can be found in Adatar Vaveda Saunaka, so with that I pierce your heart. And in Gaulish, uh, <coughs> the Proto-European root stag commonly means to bewitch, if it was correctly identified by Perry Lambert in his Hospitalet du Larzac de Fitio. So, Nick Dorsey's would mean something like, we'll have the wit. And the agent noun undings is based on the same root, but with a negative preverb on, so it would mean something like, unbewitched. Thus, I, th I personally think that the semantic passage in the New Christian curse formula could be something like, um, being cursed, chetik menos, through, uh, in the sense of being the victim of a spell and therefore simply a curse. Uh, concerning the bilingual structure, um, we could, I just decided to put the inscription number 19 because it's one of the most complete ones, but I think that whatever inscription would have done for here. So um, basically at the beginning of the inscription, there is the epitaph, which is in Greek, an unmarked language which states clearly usually the name of the deceased buried under the stele uh, of the people who build the tomb, their family relationship, and then there is the proper inscription in neo -Frigian. Uh Of course, the choice of neo -Frigian in the actual part of the uh, imprecation was intentional because it was considered a device to increase the force of the curse itself. It was important to communicate with the deities through so-called co-switching with the gods as love correctly defines it, uh, namely addressing the deities in their native language, uh, thus enhancing the chances of being entered. Uh, fidelity to the ancestral cults and traditional preacher divinities such as Bas, uh, the divinity coming from the Pontus region, and T, which correspond to Zeus or Terhuntas, uh, would prove the only possible way to effectively invoke uh, the gods and protect the tombs of the desecrators. Uh, so this specific type of bilingualism uh, finds also a huge number of parallels in the Anatolian area. Um, and the more obvious example for uh, ancient Anatolia are for sure the Hittite Luvian bilingual magic text, uh, where the descriptive parts of the rituals are written in Hittite, but all the other spells are in cuneiform Luvian. Uh, but however, I think that the most the closest parallel from a chronological point of view would actually be uh, the Greek magical papyri uh, included in the three and four, which in where the contextualization of the spell is in Greek, but the spell is itself is on Coptic Egyptian. So from the, as the inscription are mostly from the second and the third century CE, this would be like the closest chronological parallel. Um, concerning the binormal expressions, so in one of the most common variants of the hypothesis of the neo frigian curse formula, uh, it is possible to isolate the binomial expression medeoske, zemeloske, which means among gods and men. And uh, the use of formulaic binomials, i.e. according to Markiel 1959, the sequence of two words pertaining to the same four class, and in this case we have two that is, uh, placed on an identical level of syntactic hierarchy, and in this case they both uh, depend on me, which means among, 
uh, and ordinarily connected by some kind of lexical link, and in this sign is just the conjunction, the decoplative conjunction pe. Um, it is a rhetorical device which is meant to increase the solemnity of riddle speech and it slows down the pace of the sentence. Uh, moreover, they are arranged from the shortest, so the shortest elements of cells here, to the longest semblance, so in accordance with the Hagel's slow increasing terms. And the pair, Didis and Newman's, of course, um, derives directly from Indo-European, because, of course, in, as Professor Gacera Mon told us, the worldview of Indo-Europeans has a primary opposition between uh, everything that concerns the heavens and um, everything that concerns the earth. So the preservation of the Indo-European <coughs> roots in the region is remarkable. And exact etymological parallels of these uh, formulaic binomial can be found also in Vedic, Italic, and Celtic, and you can see on point four, point five of your end up. So in the Rig Veda, for example, it is possible to read the Beshrika, uh, Manushe Shrika, so among men and gods. Uh, in Latin, Quintus Ennius uses the formula de quae ominum quae several times in the Annales, always with reference to Jupiter, and not always only to translate the Homeric phrase pater andronte teonte. Uh, then a Latin Gaulish bilingual inscription, uh, found at Vercelli, designates the land of a certain guy named Assisius as uh, Teutonian. So Michel Lejeune analyzed this Tuan Dua Compad adjective uh, as applied to Atom or Atos, so field pertaining to the, the gods and the men, and so tra translating the corresponding Latin form, Comunem Dei et Omnibus Campus. Campo. Uh, finally, uh, the meter. So this is a problem. So since the beginning of the 20th century, there have been several attempts to find a metric scheme in the new region curse formula, and research in this sense is coherent because um, curse formula pertains to original speech. I would just focus on the most um, recent attempts of metric particularization, <coughs> which is Alexander Lubotsky's one from 1998, and Martin West, 2003, before proposing my own idea. So Alexander Lubotsky tried to trace back the variants that characterize the new region unary curse formula to a single archetype to the reconstruction of a protoformula in dactylic hexameters. According to him, it erased over time because the system was no longer understood. Uh, a quantitative opposition between long and short vowels was lost in the New Frigian period. Uh, so syllables could be long only per position and in presence of distance. So, taking into account this constraint, the bots reconstructed the metric for the formula in the following way. Um, however, in my opinion, um, there are some problems because, um, so if we consider the Frigian inscriptions, Knumani is supposed to have like a short U, so the diphthong or U that you can see there is definitely like a normal U in Frigian. It's just the way they used to write U in Frigian. So this is a short U and also short A in Kumani, Kakun as well as a short U. So it definitely needed something because we have only four dactyls there. It definitely needed something more. And so I decided to add this I Niateamas to, you know, fill this gap. But this is a very rare variant, so it is found only in two inscription, number 112 and 120. And so, as we're thinking of an archetypical sort of formula, it would have, have more sense to choose something that was widespread and not something that we can find only in two inscriptions. Mm -hmm. And then concerning the hypothesis, if we assume that uh, Tita Tikmenos should be, you know, a unique thing, so if T is the proof of the Tikmenos, then it would have had more sense to just, you know, stick it together, but he needed another short syllable there. So, I mean, we need some adjustments here and there. Um, then uh, Martin West apparently recognized in the preserved New Frigian curse formula a sequence of short verses of the type of Greek Laconic, of the Greek Phrygian, and of the Iambic Metre. These were all very archaic verses in Greek, which were attested from the 7th to the 5th century BCE. And they found also parallels in another in other European languages, namely the octosyllabic verses and the heptosyllabic verses of the Rig Veda. So according to West reconstruction, therefore, the New Frigian proto formula would fit perfectly within the framework of, uh, of one of the Indo-European metric prototypes. So plus plus eight plus eight plus seven syllables. Uh, as he reconstructed them in one of his papers in 1973. It is true that the idea of detecting a metric structure directly inherited from Indo-European, you know, Phrygian curse formula is very attractive, 
also because we have uh, the presence of the binomial expression Deus Kess and Deus Kess, uh, which finds etymological and conceptual parallels in other European languages. Uh, however, as far as I know, Indian Europeans did not really have inscribed stele to protect the tombs of their deceased from potential wrongdoers, and specific funerary curse formula in the sense because the tomb was perceived as a material property, so with this contradict value, was actually attested in the Semitic Near East. So, for example, in Egypt or in Phoenicia, Syria, and not really in the Indo European world at the beginning. So, However, recently, Alexander Lubotsky focused again on a neo phrygian inscription with meter problems, and I found his observation um, really illuminating in this sense, because he noticed that in this inscription that you can see here, this is this Dokumeyan inscription, uh, one of the oldest and most interesting neo phrygian inscriptions, because uh, it's the first one, I mean, the first one that we know, written in the Greek alphabet. Uh, so the Frisians abandoned the Epicurean alphabet. And um, he noticed that the two dots, this word punctuation mark that you can find here, actually uh, were not a way to, um, let's say, highlight some interesting part of the inscriptions, but really a way to separate colon. And uh, if we count the syllables, we can see that the average, we have something like 17, sometimes 16, sometimes 18. So there's definitely an attempt at metric regularization here. Uh, then, uh, if we think of this other inscription, this is um, the uh, altar of Anacolia, it was found by Alexandru Avram, and here again uh, we have uh, the dedication in Greek and the curse in Phrygian, and again uh, Avram found something which was a kind of an attempt uh, at metric colonization. <coughs> so, um, I think that I can say what I think. So basically, uh, the, two the two inscriptions we've seen uh, are from two different periods. So the first one that we saw was just um, at the beginning of the um, Greek domination, Macedonian domination of Anatolia. So it is possible that effectively we had like a mixture between the uh, native Frigophone and the um, and the new Macedonian dominators. So there was an attempt, let's say, at giving some um, more refined look to the Phrygian inscriptions by giving them the aspect of the, um, the Greek uh, epitaph in the Tilic examples. <coughs> Uh, the second one that we saw actually uh, was just the inscription of a humble person. It was a priest who founded the cult of Zeus of Brogimarus, the kind of personal Jesus. This guy called Brogimarus decided to institute the cult of Zeus of Brogimarus. And so, um, in general, so the new Phrygian inscriptions of the Roman era uh, are not the product of the Hellenized urban elite, because the Hellenized urban elite spoke Greek and they were living in the cities. You are talking of the countryside, the central highlands of Phrygia. And so these inscriptions were uh, carved by rural men whose social position was not so distinguished but who had enough money to build a tomb for the deceased relatives. And in my opinion, these people perceived the metrical structure of the Greek funerary epigrams as a trait belonging to the highest style of the highest social classes to be imitated in the Phrygian epicoid language as well. And the desire to imitate a metric structure in a, living, in a given language without truly possessing the technical methods of mastering it is a frequent feature among the most humble classes of the population. In this aspect, I recall uh, the Latin funeral epigrams of the late Republican and Imperial era, which are composed in a sort of emulation of approximation of the Tidic examiners that Warmington calls exametric rhythms. So you can see one of these in handout 5.10. And so I can say that even though uh, Alexander Lubotsky's and Martin West's attempts to reconstruct a metric neo Phrygian proto formula are nice, uh, maybe we're not really dealing with proto formula to be reconstructed, but they were trying to build their own meter here. They were trying to do something that was close to the example of the Greek. So, um, and as well, it might be emphasized that we have a lot of variance, a lot of mistakes. And so uh, all these things like doesn't allow me to find an actual regular meter in all this. Um, and even in the case of emulation of approximation of the Tilic examiners, technically we're still being with growth in some, you know, <laughs> somehow. 
So we're now able to jump to our conclusions. So keeping in mind my analysis uh, in light of, you know, what I think of regional speech, it is possible to draw the following conclusions uh, that to take panos means cursed, and this is the verb that describes the speech act. And uh, so it, it derives, in my opinion, from pro European stake, so strength curse, because the uh, semantic development would be uh, piercing the tikmanos like through T someone in the sense of being the victim of a spell and therefore simply accursed. Uh, then the characteristic bilingual structure, Greek region of the uh, New Frigian inscription was intentional as the fidelity to the ancestral language was perceived as the only way to effectively invoke the ancestral gods in order to protect the king from desecrators. Uh, the use of formulaic binomials uh, is a rhetorical device meant to increase the solemnity of regal speech. And we can find etymological parallels of Medeus que semelos que, of course, in other European languages, such as Vedic, Italic, and Celtic. And concerning meter, I think that in the best case, the stone category is simply trying to reproduce the overall impression of the Greek funerary epigrams in the Athletic Examiners in Frigian, because imitating a metric structure without possessing the technical skills required to mastery is a common feature among the lower such as classes who want to imitate the upper middle classes. And so if you want to have a very good uh, voodoo doll, you should go to this place in Hollywood where you can have these amazing donuts shaped in a, in a voodoo doll and it's filled with jelly and there's chocolate. So that's an amazing thing. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> very very rich and uh, for I love your PowerPoint so just gonna send it this. Uh, okay. <laughs> I really love it. Uh, questions, comments, inputs. Uh, short comment something you might be interested in a parallel example of this logic. Persians, we find in a unique inscription, not very far from where we are now, <laughs> um, in southern Sweden, mm -hmm. leaking a very says The inscription has a is, um, has an announcement, makes an announcement. It's from the seventh, seventh century. Usarbaspa, uh, I predict unpleasant. Yeah, and it says that. <coughs> He or she, or he, supposedly, who destroys this monument will be cursed. But there's a very specific um, way in which this person will be cursed. He will develop uh, this... Uh, uh, he will be... Uh, uh, well, I suppose you could basically translate it as raped. Yeah. So the, 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 this noun denoting passive made hom homosexuality, aragil, which has an interesting Indo-European background as well, yeah. is one of the consequences. So the person who breaks this monument will be a passive homosexual. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I have so to I, you know it. It's amazing. So I thought that was the, that. the logic is very similar to Yeah. Yeah, give me the reference. Bjorketor, the okay. Bjorketor stone. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Milena, for this paper. That was really uh, fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm just adding further evidence for your um, for possible evidence you might know already about it. But anyway, for your um, idea of cursing as piercing, you, you, you've probably seen that um, many cursed tablets which were excavated and found were found already pierced. Uh, not yeah, so yeah. not just the figure in itself, but the tablets yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's an, another interesting parallel from. Um, the second century of the, the common era in a papyrus from Egypt, which I think is kept in Paris, yes. there's a description of um, a, a curse ritual with basically the building of a clay figure in, which mm -hmm. has to be yeah. pierced by 13. Exactly, this bronze. is the this is the one I've been talking. Yeah, and, and, and they also found that the, the actual the actual thing, uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. Figurine, and I'm sure you'll find from every basically yeah. uh, every Indo European culture. And I wonder how much of this in a more general methodological question how much of this is a sort of universal of cursing 
and how much we can trace uh, specific roots of, of sort of inherited concepts. Uh, I wonder if you have looked at other maybe non-related culture as well, since we find so many in, in the Indo-European world. I wonder how much common that was in general, in a way, to peer, to, to curse through piercing, uh, yeah. for, you know, further, further enlargement of projects. I, I, I don't know yeah. if it might be worth looking at at what non-Indo-European people do yeah. when they curse. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Of course, all the Buddhist stuff, yeah, of course. But in this case, it was interesting because, you know, it was the verb. So I thought that, you know, it could be, it could be very well there. Because, for example, Dubotsky mostly think of the idea of judging. But I think that here, as we're thinking of ritual speech, so it's mostly the idea of doing something more, you know, more <laughs> specific and active rather than just judging, right? So... I prefer this route because, mm. you know, judging didn't look like something to, let's say, ritual enough to me, it more looked like something more legal, and here we're talking about something else. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, I mean, you, are, you quote uh, Sadowski's uh, paper, who makes reference to both Indo-European <laughs> and non-Indo-European parallels. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, Confident, you are completely aware of it. Just a short uh, question, which is a more wish one. But is there anything which you could etymologize as to bind? In here? Yeah, like in I don't know in this course formula somewhere. In this specific one, no. No, no, in the specific one, no, because unfortunately we only have the tip as uh, We have another verb, mm -hmm. uh, which is the grey manos, but it's something in most like, uh, may your bread be rotten. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, I, I, I've been looking into that, and no, I only found the, the, only the idea of cursing, cursing. and bread being rotten, and your children <laughs> suffering from horrible pains. <laughs> no, oh, this wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Um, well. Mm, and I even, do. for example, also because we also have some translations uh, in Greek, the idea of binding is somehow absent there. And Sarawani thinks that it's mostly something more common in the continent, in continental Greece, mm -hmm. and it was something connected mostly to um, love and politics rather than then, okay. than cursing for the tombs. Because this is a very specific kind of um, of imprecation, so we don't have imprecation in continental Greece concerning the tomb, so protection of the tomb through maledictions, through curses. Um, this is a very a specific Anatolian things that happened when the um, the Lydian Lycians Frigians went in contact into the. Uh, Semitic population, because at that time under the Persian Empire, so 4th century BCE, mm -hmm. we had the um, Aramaic as the language of the, the of the Macedonian Empire. So at that point, we started seeing the um, real imprecations, real curses to protect tombs, because the idea of the tomb as a material property is a very Semitic thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we don't have this idea of binding because binding was more seen as a political or a sexual thing. Oh. And here is absence. I see, I see. Well, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, probably yes, I'll just a uh, uh, short comment, as short as I can, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, uh, but yeah, so the what I was uh, thinking about is not so so much about ritual speech, but yeah, so but about the fragility of all this uh, stuff. Uh, I mean, so the, the structure you build is actually very nice uh, as soon as the foundation holds. Yeah? So, but I'm afraid, so in this case, we do not have iron pillars. And yeah, so the, just one thing, uh, so the, uh, about man, uh, it's in the interpretation as a man, yeah? so, and uh, basically it's based only on this context. Yeah? So, uh, uh, and so Lyubovsky thinks that it's meta. So, um, yeah, this uh, this may be, but how you, uh, well, uh, explain uh, so like the, such a like, uh, drastic shortening. And uh, so just to mention that, the, so, it you know, there have been the, several interpretations. One was in front and, and one is uh, among, but 
Actually, like there right is another now, one which uh, would actually turn it all uh, upside down. So the uh, you is? know the Annalisa Hemming uh, proposed ah. on the basis of the another like attestation of this man. Uh, the one in the Vezirens uh, TV. Bas Bekos Mebert. So this is like yeah. The, the, uh, in the sense of of yeah. the con no, I don't think I don't agree yeah. with her in this place. Um, well, I mean, so the, so the one should still take it into consideration, yeah. So and uh, so if if it's indeed so like uh, a prohibitive uh, particle, then uh, then uh, the manner should be positive. Yeah. semeros ke tithetik menusaitu. You don't have metetik menusaitu. No, yeah, so it's different. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. in this case. How would you justify the two dates if you don't have a preposition there? In the sense of four? Well, yeah, so, well, I mean, so to my mind, so the, the translation among uh, gods and men is a little bit artificial. So, because this among gods. Well, you find have... parallels in other European languages as well. So. so I you can see it in the way you feel gods, like. Or, uh, or just dative. Uh... They are two dates. They in Le in Greek and in Phrygian they also converge from the logative. The same thing you can find also in uh, in, um, in in Vedic etc. So you also find the same construction of, as well. So that means that something is going on there. And the idea of thinking of meta is cool because it allows us to th see where these people have to be. Uh, be, you, you know to see to be uh, cursed if you if you think of this idea in that case you would think of not being cursed which doesn't make sense and uh, even if you think in Dubosky's terms like thinking of the fact you know uh, being judged it would be not being judged don't think so no, yeah, so the, the answer one, one need actually so to change everything. Yeah, so yeah like, and uh, so it would be no curse and it would be no need to write uh, the thing on the stones. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, but yeah, so it's just to signalize okay. a, a problem. Yeah, so, okay, uh, thank you. Okay, one, one minute. Uh, there will be an interesting chapter to discuss on an interesting with another example of Meg. You also know that it's been on the Thank you again for the talk. And now I give the word to Michele Bianconi with Trust Me, I'm a Hittite, Anatolian Ecos of Indian European Phraseology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for organizing this wonderful conference and for giving me the chance to. Uh, present in front of such an audience, and it's an honor for me to be to be here. So um, my paper will be divided in two parts. Can I have a handout? That would be, be useful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Got it. So it will my paper will consist of two parts. I'll, I'll first give a brief account of the role um, that the Anatolian language has played in European um, poetics by reviewing some trends in scholarship. Um, and uh, to and by looking at some possible evidence of Indo-European phraseology in Anatolian, or to phrase better, of Anatolian phraseology of Indo-European ascendancy. And in doing so, I'll try to suggest a taxonomy for those elements that Anatolian shares with the other Indo-European branches, making appropriate distinctions between cases of inheritance, of contact, and of independent developments. And the second part will be de devoted to a new possible case study, which, which um, at least to my knowledge, hasn't been explored yet. Um, so as the long-standing tradition in our field, I'm going to start with a Forschungsstand, but I, I will refrain from giving a thorough and perhaps boring um, account of the history of the discipline to um, an audience who probably knows it better than I do, and more importantly, to some of the people who have actually made this history, but I'll just give a few remarks. So the Anatolian languages, as, as all of you probably know, have, have been mar relatively marginal in classic studies devoted to Indo-European uh, poetics, and, and one can only find sparse mentions in seminal works, such as Schmidt, 1967, see the first point on your handout. Well, this is partially due to the later inclusion of Anatolian in, to, in, to Indo-European studies and to the importance of the Greco-Aryan model. 
um, which represented the theoretical paradigm uh, in Indo-European phraseology, almost as much as it did in the reconstructed verbal system. Um, and, and part of it is due to the nature of the Anatolian material, which um, until not too long ago meant almost uniquely Hittite. To use Calvert Watkins's words, um, there was no immediate impetus to look um, in Hittite for tracing of Indo-European poetics, uh, because Hittite texts are nearly all in prose. However, some scholars felt that it was time to bring Hittite and Anatolian into the study of the Indo-European poetic language. Let's see the second quote from Watkins on, on your handout. And the articles by Watkins himself and by um, Jan Puvel together um, with a solid presence of, of Hittite in comprehensive works as, as Gamkrelitsa and Ivanov's, um, these paved the way for the de definitive inclusion of Anatolian in studies on Indo-European poetics. And more and more Indo-Europeanists now largely use data from Anatolian, and some of you are here today, and, and, and even some comprehensive books on Indo-European poetry and myth do take at least Hittite into account. So one can only agree with Claxon where, uh, when he writes in, in the end of the syntax part of his introductory um, book, to Indo-European, that as our understanding of early Indo-European languages beyond the classical languages and Sanskrit improves, our stock of phrasal reconstruction will increase and close reading of texts may reveal better contextual correspondences. And I believe that this is particularly true in the case of Anatolian. Greek and Indo-Iranian have always had and probably will always have a central position in Indo-European studies, and this shouldn't surprise us. Uh, since most scholars who researched on comparative Indo-European poetics uh, were Hellenists or Indo-Iranianists. But today, just as Anatolian has become of paramount importance to the reconstruction of the proto-language, it should also acquire, I think, a primary role in the reconstruction of the proto-poetic language. Not only is Hittite mythology much better known than in the past, both in an aerial and in a comparative perspective, but our improved understanding of minor languages such as Luvian unlocks texts, which may preserve a lot of interesting data, as we will see soon. Now, a couple of general questions may arise. So where, first, where do we stand today? Is there any further space for analysis, or have, has everything been said? And two, provided we find further similarities between the phraseology of one or more Anatolian language and the other Indo-European traditions, can we arrange them in a heuristically valid model? In other words, can we set up any taxonomy? Well, in my opinion, the answer to both questions is yes, but the reasons behind such positive answers are intertwined and mutually dependent. And I'll start from the second point and leave the demonstration of the first one to the case studies I'm going to present in a moment. I think the, the standard method for the study of, of, of linguistic similarities may be used with great profit, both in the reconstruction of poetic language and in cultural reconstruction altogether. These two concepts should be distinguished on a methodological level. And similarities in phraseology and cultural reconstruction may be due to the same reasons as similarity in other parts of language, i.e. inheritance, contact, or independent creations due to chance, or typologically common tendencies, including what's called drift, which is essentially diachronic psychology. Um, however, we need a couple of further caveats. When it comes to cultural reconstruction, we're not always looking at systematic correspondences, as in, for example, phonology, and also the mechanisms behind contact at a purely linguistic level and cultural contact may be overlapping, but strictly speaking, they're not always the same. And this is particularly evident in the cuneiform civilizations in which both types of contact were taking place, but the results weren't always the same. So let's now have a look at a couple of examples to see if and how the material is compatible with this type of classification. So I'll start with, I believe, is a um, pan-Indo-European uh, motif in Hittite. In the first series of the Hittite laws, there's a rather enigmatic expression that at first sight might puzzle the, the reader. Urbaras kishtat, you have become a wolf. This is said after a provision concerning the punishment for the abduction of a woman. And it's usually thought to mean that the abductor stole the woman like a wolf steals a sheep from the flock. This is what usually commentators say. Um, but it was soon noted that this peculiar phrase has parallels in the Germanic world, in the Lex Salica, as you can see on your handout. And this concept seems quite common in medieval Germanic law. I found another parallel in the Lex Ripuaria, but there are many, many more. Um, Gamkrelitz and Ivanov, next page of your handout, cite uh, this uh, text in passing and saying that, that it's of Indo-European ascendancy and that there are parallels in Sanskrit, Greek, and Old Icelandic. 
But no one, as far as I know, has fully explored this issue. And I'll try to do it here very briefly, pointing out a few parallels from Sanskrit and from Greek that might explain some of the ideology behind this fanzine. Um, the Rig Veda, as all of you know, is rich in wolves, and usually what's asked for is protection from them. But in two hymns of book two and, and, and six, we find human beings who are called wolves, and they seem to be potentially harmful individuals who are at the margins or even completely out of society. Um, in the hymn to Soma, Pava, Soma Pavamana, which is most interesting for social divisions in the, in the Rigvedic period, a person who's threatening people and doesn't belong to the larger um, Arya society is explicitly called a wolf, i.e. an outlaw. Um, so it seems like this concept is well present in the Rigveda. And whereas moving on to Greek, in the Platonic passage on your handout, the person who's guilty of murder, in this case the tyrant, must be exiled from the community and becomes a wolf. It is not, wor not noteworthy that Plato reports this as a folk tale. And this might well be the case of a very archaic ideology that survived in a popular context. And one might even wonder to what extent the myth of Lycaon, who was transformed by, into a wolf by Zeus, reflects this ideology and could add further evidence. So from what it seems, all examples have in common the performance of an impure act, which causes a man to become a wolf and be out of society. And it might then be the case that the Hittite formula has either specialized to indicate the case of bright abduction, abduction or that it has preserved the idea of an archaic custom uh, with no specific reference to this crime in particular. But let's move on to a second case um, study next page of your handout. It is well known that Hittite diplomatic texts have um, a part with the provisions, a part with the oath, and the list of divine witnesses to the oath. And the order of the gods in these lists is not fixed, but generally speaking, the sun, god, sun gods, storm gods, local gods, and several other, other deities are usually followed by natural <coughs> elements, i.e. mountains, rivers, springs, the sea, heaven and earth, wind, clouds, and so on, as you can see in, your, in the example from the bronze tablet um, on your handout. Um, now, the fact that sky deities, and in particular the sun, are witnesses to oaths shouldn't surprise any Indo Europeanist, as it is a well known Proto European mm -hmm. motive. We've even seen it, uh, seen it even today in one of the passages uh, cited by Professor Garcia Ramon. It was a passage by Ennius um, on, on, on his handout. It said, Sol qui omnis speakis. Um, so the all seeing sun is a very, um, uh, very common mo motive both in the, in the Indo-European world, but it's also found in the non-Indo-European ancient Near Eastern world. And when my, one might even think that this could be a universal. However, I think there are two additional pieces of evidence that might, uh, might allow us for a, form, a more fine-grained analysis, at least for the Anatolian material. In a short article appeared in 19, 1961, uh, Giovanni Nenci first compared the structure of divine witness lists in Hittite texts and in the Homeric epics, with particular reference to the third book of the Iliad. In this passage, uh, which I reported on your handout, Agamemnon invokes Zeus, Helios, the river, the earth, and the two gods of the underworld, i.e. Hades and Persephone, openly calling them martyrs, witnesses, and asking them to protect the oaths. Several, other, uh, several scholars pointed out the dependence of this Iliadic passage from Near Eastern models, especially in the framework of shared ritual culture. But there's more to the story, as this seems that it's a specifically local Anatolian feature. Um, next point of your handout, a hieroglyphic Luvian inscription from Tel Ahmar contains a divine list, which wasn't fully understood until very recently because of the unknown phonetic reading of two signs sign 128 and sign 30. Now, the new readings of these signs proposed by Peter Hurechebure uh, in a uh, very recent article, this adds two divine names to the list, which now seems strikingly similar to the ones we've seen in Hittite and Greek. Heaven and earth, the divine mountains, the divine riverlands. And this further parallel will then corroborate the hypothesis of a cultural motive shared on both sides of the Aegean possibly even beyond. So the idea of the sun god as the all-seeing protector of oaths might well be inherited, but the list and the order of gods who are invoked as witnesses seems more of a aerially diffused feature, as it's common to Hittite, 
possibly Greek, and now possibly even Luvian. Now, um, second part of this talk, I'll move on to the new case study that I have sort of um, examined in some more detail. This is a bit more speculative, I'm afraid, but I hope you'll hold on for a bit more. Um, so in, in the, the Hittite phraseological construction, kari tia is generally translated as to be gracious towards, to comply, to go along with, etc. And it should literally mean step to graciousness. There's also a verb kariya, which is thought to have the same meaning. So the verb tia means to step, and kari, despite some discussion in the past, which we'll come back to later, is now generally connected to Protein European ker. You may see a standard interpretation of the passage on your handout, next page, the first passage I reported. Um, my father, since he was kind-hearted, was gracious <coughs> towards the word or the matter of the woman, and he dealt with the matter of the son. Now, I would like to offer an alternative interpretation of this Jungtura, since, to my knowledge, it hasn't been noticed that Karitia may be comparable uh, with one of the very few accepted Indo-European constructions. Kret de, place in the heart, or place the heart in, therefore meaning believe or trust. I will test this hypothesis first on semantic grounds and then to turn to formal features. And then I will suggest how it could have survived in Hittite in such a form. But before that, I need to make a brief excursus on this reconstructed protein European construction, point 2.2 of your handout. So today is commonly accepted that protein European had a has a phraseological expression, literally meaning place the heart in or place in the heart, which came to signify to believe, to trust or the like. This has been reconstructed mainly from Sanskrit Shraddha, confidence, devotion, of Western Srashtaiti, trust, confidence, believe, and Latin credo, I believe, as you can see from the sample texts in your um, on, on page four of your handouts. Emile Bonveniste dedicated a whole chapter of his vocabulaire to the concept of Sanskrit Shraddha and to its implications for Indo-European culture, and I have reported a long excerpt from it on your handout. So after exploring the semantic of Shraddha with multiple examples, some of which I've uh, cited on your handout above, um, he confirms that the semantic connection, he confirms the semantic connection, but at the same time he raises some doubts on the identity between reconstructed cred and the Indo-Iranian, Indo-European word for heart. Nonetheless, despite the fact that this is a, still difficult to make the case for a perfect formal congruence in Indo-Iranian, and Bonvenist's uh, interpretation has been hotly debated, um, Sanskrit shraddha um, and Latin credere are still thought to be at least loosely related with, to the protein european heart word, as you can see from the quotation I put from the most recent etymological dictionaries. So, Back to Kari Tia. From a purely semantic point of view, the Indo European expression seems compatible at least with our Hittite construction. Because if we give Kari Tia a similar value to that of Kred Te, we could translate the example we've just seen as my father, since he was kind hearted, believed or trusted the words of the woman, and he dealt with a matter of the son. So a little bit of context. This part of the deeds of Shupiluruma the first is about matters of trust and believing. The queen of Egypt, who has no sons and whose husband died, asks the Hittite king for a son who would become her husband and king of Egypt. But initially, Shupiluliuma is afraid that she's deceiving him and he sends his chamberlain to find out the truth. And in this line, where Shupiluliuma receives the report from the chamberlain and decides to trust the queen, the meaning believe seems even more suitable than comply or be gracious. Um, other occurrences of these ex this expression confirm that a meaning, believe, trust, is compatible with kari tia. Unfortunately, I have no time to read every passage. I'll leave them to you, but I'll just focus very quick, briefly on the last example. In a fragmentary prayer, so that's the uh, last example and on page six of your handout, KUB 1522. So in this um, <coughs> fragmentary prayer text recently edited by De Ross, we read Kari Tiawash and Kari Chiskitsi, respectively translated as of the indulgence and forbears. 
well, the former seems to be compatible with a normal standard sense, ut caritia, to be gracious. One cannot agree with the way caritis could see translated here, especially in light of the editor's remark that the original, you can see it on your handout, the original meaning of caritia was post oneself into someone's head. One can agree with the meaning indulge or assist as the outcome of some semantic shift, but a construct post oneself in someone's head doesn't seem plausible without further evidence. Conversely, a meaning be kind or indulge resulting from put in the heart or even a simpler trust would be more fitting. So the semantics seem to be compatible to, um, to our hypothesis and the meanings believe and trust are compatible with the examples of cari tia. How about the syntax? Next page of your handout. The hinted construction seems once again similar to the Latin and Indo-Iranian forms in that it's regularly followed by a dative locative. Hittite memiani caritiat resembles Latin credere plus dative credere alicui and shradha plus dative shrad asmai da. Um, I will now turn to morph morpho phonetics and here the situation is slightly more problematic. First, we have to deal with the etymology of tia, and then with the etymology of cari, and in particular with the absence of the dental in the dative locative. Let's start with tia. So the etymology of tia has been much debated, as it has been traced back to either the root de, Sanskrit, uh, dathami, Greek tithemi, or to the root ste, Greek histemi root. Most people today agree that tia to step comes from the latter, from the ste roots, and this would falsify my hypothesis completely. But there's an interesting detail that I think has been overlooked. Hittite also does have a verb, dai, which certainly comes from de, tithemi, roots, although there's no agreement on the precise development, but we know that Hittite does have this verb, dai. And the reason of the ambiguity of the etymology of tia, and this is crucial to, to my argument, is that the verb dai shows generalization of the thematic stem tia in younger times. In other words, some inflected forms of dai merged with the paradigm of tia. For example, a form like tiat, the one we saw, which is a third person singular preterite active, could belong either with dai or with tia. And on the basis of this, we could in theory say that tia found with kari actually goes back to de, especially in light of the fact that all is instances of kari tia are from New Hittite texts. So on purely morphological grounds, at least tia does not contradict my hypothesis. How about kari? The current etymology of kari goes back to an old suggestion by Marge reported in Sturtevant's grammar. The verb kariya uh, has a similar meaning and is thought to share the same root. Now, this is quite different from the Hittite word for heart and from the Indo-European word for heart, but there's an alternative explanation for this as well. If one follows Oettinger in considering kari, a form remade on an endingless, endingless locative, then the problem of the dental, the absence of the dental in the dative locative disappears. Now, Puvel protests, as you can see on your handout, that there's a regular dative locative karti and a verb karia, but the first objection is beside the point, since the reconstruction proposed by Oettinger is quite plausible in light of the formation of, on original endingless locatives in Hittite. And the second one, the fact that kari exists, doesn't take into account a small detail. Most attestations of kari have plain spelling, actually all of them, I think, whereas kariya never has plain spelling. And this seems to point to two different formations. Finally, there's a very interesting cultural parallel between Hittite, phraseological parallel between Hittite and Sanskrit, as in both languages, the word for heart appears to be found with a verb to, for to do or to make. One may even advance the hypothesis that the verb kariya does contain the same root as charis, yes, but that kari tia might have been associated to it secondarily. And this explanation would necessarily put my argument in contradiction with the framework of expression of favor and belief outlined by Professor Garcia Ramon in his 2006 articles. Because if we accept all of the above, it would be relatively easy to argue that the original expression merged with more productive formations. All in all, I believe that there are enough elements tentatively posit, at least, that Hithet Kari Tia could be a fossilized Indo European archaism, which became obscure after the paradigmatic um, restructuring of Dai and was possibly assimilated to the other construction with Tia and to the paradigm of Kariya because of syntactic, phonetic, 
and semantic resemblance. Mm -hmm. And again, it might not be a coincidence that both Karitia and Kariya are predominantly attested in Neo-Hittite text. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this hypothesis on the origin of Kariti and its further supporting evidence, and I'm fully aware that several problems will still be open, but hopefully this idea won't prove itself more improbable than others, and in the best case will compete with the traditional ones, perhaps laying the grounds for other tools to build upon, or perhaps constituting what we call in classical philology a diagnostic conjecture, in a way. So now time to conclude. I first um, argued that the rapid and ongoing progress in Anatolian philology and linguistics allows us to look at Anatolian in light of Proto-European, and at Proto-European in light of Anatolian from new angles. And careful analysis of the Anatolian material might provide support for challenge established theories, or even provide space for new case studies, as I've tried to demonstrate. And if you don't trust me or believe me, please at least be gracious, if you will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very, very rich talk. And uh, question, yeah, uh, I see you, uh, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for your Hi, talk. You. Very interesting talk. Um, maybe you could be interested in an article by Tim McCohen uh, about the war uh, in uh, the European war ideology, who actually also uh, mentions uh, an old Irish uh, panel, which might be mm -hmm. interesting. Thank you. Plus, uh, great uh, dog with me. Thank you. Which actually means uh, stranger. Uh, it's used as stranger. So, yeah. it would be of interest for your. Yeah, thank you very much. No, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, there's plenty of evidence. I also, I've also uh, seen in my research that there was actually a long article of book. I'm not really sure by Ivanov, 1975, but that was never translated into uh, a Western language. And unfortunately, I can't read Russian <laughs> yet. I'm hoping to be able to access it in the future, but. Um, I, I'm sure he develops that theme even even more as well. But yeah, I, I didn't know about the make own article. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, that, that's do, that's doable. That should be doable. <laughs> I will give you the reference. Uh, thank you. I I also sorry. Um, yeah, the word, just because my I also have a common disconnection. Mm. If the name of um, if the alleged etymology of the Nordic hero Shardon. Uh, so this Nordic hero is uh, the trickster guy mm -hmm. in the Nordic sagas, and uh, in uh, well, I don't know if this is correct, but uh, the um, he is an outsider par excellence, and the alleged etymology, uh, well, the, it, the or the standard connection which is done is with shur and shurdon, mm -hmm. and shur means um, beast, hmm. so could be also. Thank you. Like yeah. A, yeah. No, no, yeah. Plenty of heroic names in, yeah, in, in the wolf, yeah, the Beowulf and everything. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. It's really um, on point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Joshua? Um, yes, hi. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of what I think about Karitia, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure, but I was bothered by what you said at the very end about the idea that this would be um, an archaism in a way. Because surely the fact that in uh, Italic and Celtic, and largely in Indo-Iranian, though not entirely, the two are really pushed together, Shraddha and so on, um, surely that must be archaic uh, morphologically, mm -hmm. at least, and or syntactically and morphologically, vis-a-vis -vis anything that you would have in an expression like this. Isn't that true? I mean, I, I mm. just, it, it seems to me, it seems to me that if you want this to work, it would be at least as likely that it's an independent collocation of a very common word and mm. something from the heart, then it would be some sort of archaism vis-a-vis -vis an already univer largely univerbated. But what do you make of, what do you make of the Latin credo? Well, I mean, that's already quite Sort of put together. It's from put the... together. It's put together. It's put together in Celtic. It's largely yeah. put together in Indo-Iranian. It's true. I mean, the noun, of course, it is put together in the verb. Yes, you can you can separate uh, you can separate them as in Osra, yeah. Osma, etc. But um, but I mean, fundamentally, they're going together in a way that's really very different from having a phrase that has a, a, a locative in it. I mean, all of your Hittite examples. I don't know whether this is the full set of evidence have. This uh, would be Kari Lakhi 
that is immediately followed by the verb tia. I don't know if that's true. Um, but that's, although they look as though they're right next to each other, the way mm. you have it in study, yeah. Italic yes. and Celtic, it feels like a completely different thing. And I mm. just wonder whether you could be right. I'm not sure I think you are right, but suppose you're right, but it could be accidental. That is to say, you're just, again, taking a very common verb, and you're taking a, I would say, very common sort of expression about parts and throwing them together in a way that just makes it appear to be more the same than everything else. I wonder else. how, though, I wonder, I mean, this, this, um, the, the hard parts, the kai, is very isolated in Hittite, and it does, in all the appearances I've um, reported, um, it does, it does occur all together in, in a way. And also we have this karia, I still have to fully understand the relationship between the two, but if, if karia was actually the same, there you would have an, a, a real sort of merger between the, the two in Karia. Yeah. So you, one could make that point, I haven't seen. The other thing is, I'm afraid, that the evidence I presented is only based on um, what Poolville reports in his dictionary, because I didn't have access, because there's not one copy in the whole of Great Britain, <laughs> to the new um, number, the new Lieferung of the um, Etymologische uh, Wörterbuch. They've just arrived to Kar, it's just the, 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 the latest one, and I couldn't get access to them. I don't know if there are more, there's more evidence. The idea is to complement this with further evidence. I've seen all, I've, I've looked at all the evidence that Pouville sort of Got gathers, it. and it all seems sort of together, a, 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 a weird sort of package of carry tier together. There's not much sort of flexibility in it. But yes, if you find new cases, then it's worth looking at the relationship between carry tier and, and, and karia. But I think one could sort of go further and say, well, maybe there was a sort of univerbation at some point in Karia, but I'm not sure yet. This is still, you know, I'm, I'm still uh, an earlier stage of, of, of this research. I'm just, you know, throwing the idea and seeing how how it goes for, for the moment. So, uh, I've seen two further questions, uh, but uh, we will have time for maybe two of them. Uh, oh, I think Taupan was I think before. Just, uh, I, I really like your idea of uh, connecting the, the, the Hittite uh, with the very common phraseology of the belief. Yeah. But, uh, and I see that uh, you also proved that there's no difficulty concerning the morphology uh, because you can explain the cardio as the uh, ending is yeah, mm -hmm. the Yeah. Uh, so actually, your argument is based on the semantic analysis. And then I just uh, checked uh, very, very quickly. If you check the answer, Clara, it can also, I mean, the very co common meaning is me. I think everyone knows. Yeah. Yeah. But it can also mean desire in Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. So actually, the semantic sphere of leave and to desire can overlap. And then if you check Greek, uh, the Greek. This is a uh, very common word, uh, aseos, which means to uh, to have faith, to faith, mm -hmm. to have belief. But it also means beloved. Mm. So, I mean, I, I, I really love your idea, but <laughs> if you want to uh, put forward your thesis, to put forward your suggestion, I think you need to think more about the semantic overlapping of mm. to believe and to love, to desire. Yeah. Because in ancient languages, they, they cannot be separated. Yeah, no, that, that that's this, true. That's just my. That's true. No, thank you for your for your comments. Actually, I'll, I'll I'll go even further. There's you know even more to go. I mean, one should actually um, compare this with with a whole set of expression. I, I just briefly cited an article by Professor Tiaramon in which he included caritia as well. One should take this as sort of a um, part of a bigger framework. Uh, you know, limits of time space and and every and research as well i'm not yet at that sort of advanced stage but yes no definitely it will need to be enlarged it's just a starting point it will need to be looked in within a, within a bigger framework definitely okay. absolutely but thank you yeah, yeah. Uh, it was the last very Harrison, short thank you very much for thank your you. second paper yeah you know that i don't fully agree <laughs> <laughs> there are two points yeah mm -hmm. so actually the dental at the end in it is possible to have happy Mm -hmm. so in other words, you have no reason to, I, I assume there is no magical reason to eliminate the tree, uh, as in the card, 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 yeah, is a major point, I would say. Uh, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, in Greek, uh, in the 
they continue these hurries, they continue under for help and mm -hmm. uh, trust and to yeah. be helpful in this hurry. In other words, again, the semantics uh, plays a major role here. If you want to argue this, that the, the complex is very nice, but I would say to the dental, it is not convincing, in mm -hmm. my opinion, yeah? And on the other hand, <coughs> Creativity is very clear in between uh, Warra and uh, the match Warra and uh, Harry mm -hmm. is more or less clear, and in Greek is evident Hera and Harry. This is why I would not remember. Mm. This, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm not contradicting the the, the um, identities you've just out, uh, outlined. The Karitia is is really separate, and also um, I'm saying that it's sort of because of these established correspondences you've you've, mm -hmm. you've outlined, this might have assimilated. To these more productive yeah, 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 things, yeah. it's my karitia that sort of gets assimilated. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this doesn't doesn't put in any way um, in, in contradiction. For the dental, very quickly, it really depends on what you think of endingless locatives to start with. It depends on what you think on on the idea of formations on endingless locatives to start with. Um, Care cardias is uh, has a dental uh, stem, so the the, the, the dative locative would be cardi, not cart. So at the end, so that's a sort of different class. I wouldn't be too worried about that part. But yes, the, the, the dental is one of the most difficult parts, honestly. And, and for now, um, Oettinger's explanation, yes, it works slightly ad hoc, but he didn't come up with it for this specific reason. I just basically use it for this. But I, I know it's not a perfect you know, match and everything, but I, I still think there are elements to make this tentative suggestion at least and see how to weigh it against other hypotheses, yeah. Thank you. I have to stop the discussion here. I'm sure if you want to have the break. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, we are running about 10 minutes late. So we, I would say we could come back instead of uh, the good compromise would be to come back at 11.35, like instead of yeah, 25 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you.